Well, good morning, everyone. We ready to rise up? Amen. He's still rolling stones, right? That's why we're here. Time to keep moving, time to live. So we're so glad you're coming, but I, I want to take us back here a little bit in time. I, I know it's early in the morning, but I want to take us back to our elementary school days. All right, I want to take us back to the elementary school science room. All right, and you remember back then, there, there were these models that they had in our classrooms. Uh, they were this model of a solar system. You remember these? They were, they're meant to tell us something about all this spinning that's going on. Uh, we got the Earth spinning around its own axis, turning day into night. And while that's spinning, we got the Earth itself spinning around the sun. For every 365 times, more or less, it spins around, it goes once around the sun. And just to make more, things more fun and interesting, while we're doing all that spinning, there's a moon that's spinning around us about 12 times for every one time around the sun. So that's a lot of spinning going on. But we human beings, we're clever. So we invented things to keep track of all the spinning. Things like calendars and watches and iPhones so that we can track all this spinning. Re really, that's what time is. It's just a way to track all this spinning through the universe. So, for example, if we live to be 100, it means that we've spun around the earth or spun around the sun some 100 times, more or less. And while we were spinning around this sun 100 times, we're spinning around the globe some 36,524 times. And of course, while we're doing all that spinning, the moon is spinning around us some 1,200 times. Are you dizzy yet? So all of this spinning, it begs a question. What are we doing during all this spinning? All those trips around the sun, we only have so many of them. God only allotted so many trips around the sun. Some of us were just getting started of us. Some of us were on bonus laps now, you know? <laughs> and what, what are we doing on all those trips around the sun? God put us on this journey and he and he alone decides when to take us off the ride. So what are we doing on that ride? What are we doing with all of our days and months and years? How are we spending our time? You know, this is the last week or the week before Easter, the last Sunday before Easter. We've been in the middle of this series called Rise Up. The challenge has been, how do we tap into the power of Christ's resurrection? How does he move the stones away? How, what are those graves that keep us tied down, those chains that are weighing us down, that keep us from experiencing the power of God in our lives? And we've looked at things like uh, fear and addiction and anger and weakness and perfectionism, all those things that are just tying us down, keeping us from experiencing the power of God. And this week, we want to take on perhaps the most difficult obstacle at all, of all. It's this obstacle of time. It's something we all have. It's, it's this chain that seems to wrap us up. Some of us, we don't have enough time, right? There are not enough hours in a day. There are all those things that people expect us to do, all these things that we expect of ourselves. There's too many tasks, too many responsibilities. There are not enough hours in a day. But for other us, others among us, we have too much time. Too much time waiting for God to do something. Too much time waiting for a new job or waiting for a rewarding relationship or waiting for someone to get over something or waiting for our body to heal. We're just waiting, 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 and the clock seems to move oh so slow. Or maybe we're just lonely. We spend a lot of time wondering when it's time to just go to bed. Or maybe we're retired and we have day after day after day and we're just wondering, I have so much time. 
So regardless of where it is, it seems like none of us, very few of us realize we have just enough time, right? We either have not enough time or too much time. The clock, we either want to make the clock move faster or the clock moves slower. But here's the thing, that stubborn clock, it doesn't change speed, man. It just goes tick, tick, tick. One more tick of the clock, one more spin of the earth, one more time around the sun. What are we supposed to do with all this time? Now, of course, in this struggle of time, we want to blame God because, of course, it's all his fault. He's the one that put us on this crazy ride in the first place. It was his decision to put us in the middle of all this spinning. And he's the one that gave us all this responsibility to take care of ourselves, to take care of our families, to have a job, to deal with other people, to deal with broken bodies. And, 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 and so he's the one that allows all these situations. And so I think it's fair to ask him an important question. What does he want us to do with all this time? That's our critical question for today. How does God want us to spend the time? Because the world has all kinds of ideas, we have all kinds of ideas, but somehow no matter what we do, we're always at this place where we feel like there's not enough time or there's too much time. And so it seems appropriate to say, God, this was your idea. What do you want us to do with this time? And so we're gonna look at that question today. And to do that, I wanna look at a very practical book called the Book of James. If you take your sermon notes out here, you'll see at the bottom the critical question, how does God want us to spend our time? And on the back are the scripture passages we're going to look at today, and we're going to go to this book of James. Now, I believe, and many scholars believe, that James was the brother of Jesus. That is, he grew up with Jesus in his house. And at some point, we're not sure when, James came to realize that this brother of his that lived in his house was also the Son of God, the Messiah. And from other books in the New Testament, we realize that this James, he became a leader in the early church. And we also know something about his character. He was a no-nonsense kind of guy. Here's the truth, live by it. Not a lot of discussion, not a lot of conversation. Know it, do it. I think you would have met a good New Englander, you know, not a lot of fluff. <laughs> and so we're going to look at his advice today about how to spend time. So we're going to go into his letter and we're going to look at, begin at James chapter 4 and begin in verse 13 where he addresses this subject of time. He says, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Before James tells us how to spend our time, he tells us we need to stop and think and ask ourselves some important questions. Why? Why are you doing what you're doing? He starts with this business person who do what business people do. They, they make plans and make money. That's just their nature. That's how they act. It seems like a normal thing to do. But James says, if this is the formula, there, there's something missing here. There's a piece missing in this formula. What would it be? In Economics 101, we learned that profit was the reward for taking a risk. That's the heart of capitalism. Profits, the reward for taking a risk. That's the definition. But what if we change that definition a little bit? What if we said that profit is the meaning of life? What if we said that it's all about making profit? That our goal in life is to make profit. And so we're going to do everything we can to make plans because we want to make profit. Our business is our life. Our work is our life. We want to make money. Now all of a sudden, it's not just something we do, it's our passion, it's our drive, it's our religion. Chasing profit becomes who we are. Know anybody like that? Hey, did you see them in the mirror this morning? <laughs> see, our culture, it's very good at chasing things, isn't it? It's what we do as human beings. It's how we're brought up. We're here to chase stuff like profit. 
Our culture majors in profit. One might even say, or majors in chasing. It, it might even be our religion in our country today, chasing. I, I uh, did something I don't often do. I actually listened to some pop music. <laughs> I know it's shocking. And I actually had to look up the words because I don't know what they're saying. <laughs> I'm old, okay, so I admit that. So I, I looked up the lyrics for the top two songs on the popular charts when I was comparing the sermon. And so these are the top two songs. I, I'm just going to read a few of the lyrics. The first song starts off this way. Yeah, breakfast at Tiffany's and bottles of bubbles, girls with tattoos who like getting in trouble, lashes and diamonds, ATM machines, buy myself all my favorite things. Uh, that's chasing. That's, that's what's important. That's what we're going after. That's, that's what's sung out there. That's the most popular song in our country, Chasing. The second song, it, it kind of builds on that same idea, but it has an interesting twist, an interesting question. It's about somebody who's watching someone else who gets to the top, who has everything. It goes, part of the lyrics go like this. Tell me, how's it feel sitting up there? feeling so high but too far away to hold me. You know, I'm the one who put you up there, name in the sky. Does it ever get lonely? There's somebody who watches someone else get to the top. Somebody who should have it all, and yet even our culture has an understanding that somehow this chasing has a weakness in it. Something begins to miss. It's a paradox, and yet we keep chasing even though we know it goes nowhere. And sometimes this, this whole movement, it, it, it becomes tragically clear to us. When we see somebody in the news who, from our perspective, should be totally okay. I mean, they have it all. They have the fame, they have the money, they have the luxury, they have the pleasure, they have the health, they have the family, they have the beauty, they have, they have everything. And then we find out they choose to end it all because they found out that chasing doesn't work. It doesn't lead anywhere, it's empty, it's meaningless. See, all these warning signs in the culture, they should cause us to ask ourselves a very important question. What are we chasing? Maybe it's not profit, but most of us are chasing something. And there are some problems with chasing that James is pointing out to us in this text. Chasing is always focused, he says, on tomorrow. It's always about tomorrow. You know why? Because we don't have enough today. We don't have enough today. We need more. We need more money. We need more pleasure. We need more health. We need more uh, strength. We need something more. But that's tomorrow. And so we spend today chasing more tomorrow. But tomorrow is not a certainty. Tomorrow, for some of us, may never come. We've all seen it happen tragically too many times. There are no more tomorrows, and oftentimes we don't know the day and the time where our tomorrows stop, when God decides it's time to take us off the ride. And James's point is, if you spend your time today working for tomorrow, what happens when tomorrow doesn't happen, then what is today worth then? Because there is no tomorrow. But we hedge our bets because, see, the point is, in our lives, and our trips around the sun, there have been plenty of tomorrows. We've seen tomorrow so many times. So even in our heads somewhere, we know tomorrow may be, never come. We act as if it will. We plan as if it will. We go forward as if it will. But James reminds us there's another truth about tomorrow. We don't control tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. If we spend our life changing for tomorrow, what happens if tomorrow changes? We've seen that happen over and over again too. Finances change, relationships change, accidents happen, health deteriorates. Things change, not always for the better. In fact, the one constant in life is that things change. <laughs> or as John Lennon used to put it, life is what happens while you're making other plans, right? So tomorrow is not a certainty, but there's another problem. One more problem with this chasing after tomorrow. 
I mentioned before that it means we're not, today is starting to be meaningless. What's the point of today then, if everything's chasing for tomorrow? All of a sudden today is filled up with stuff that doesn't last. We don't take advantage of today. We start to wonder what the point is today if it's not getting us to tomorrow. We start to ask questions about meaning and importance and significance of today. It's like that mist, James says, that when our life is over, it just kind of disappears. And what happened? What happened to all the days? Have you ever woken up in the middle of the night and started asking yourself, what is the point? <laughs> What's the point? of getting up every day and going to work and dealing with the boss and dealing with the coworkers? What's the point of dealing with uh, people in this world that are broken? What's the point of I'm doing this? Nobody's listening, no one's paying attention. I'm going on, my kids aren't paying attention. My spouse is doing what they want. The job is going crazy. What is the point, God? What's the meaning of today? Why even get up and do this one more time around the sun? You know, I've learned something over the years about when I get in those places where I start to ask what's the meaning, I've learned that for me, it means I'm chasing something. It's a sign to me that I want something that God's not given me. I want something. Whatever, it may be a good thing, but I want it, and I don't have it. And when I don't see myself getting it, then I wake up today and I wonder, what's the point, God? No matter what I do, I don't seem to get that safe place or that comfortable place or that luxurious place or I don't get what I'm after. I'm after that. And I find myself like that business person that they're just there today making plans for tomorrow and if it doesn't seem to be working, then I wonder what's the point of spending my day and spending my time So let's stop and think before we just spend our lives chasing. But what's the answer to the question? How do we move forward, James? What, what advice can you give us about making today meaningful? Why do I matter? I mentioned today that it is Palm Sunday, and through most of the world we're thinking about Christ's coming to Jerusalem in triumph. You remember that day, it was a glorious day. He comes to Jerusalem and, and people are given the word that he's coming. And so they prepare the pathway. Uh, they take off their cloaks, they throw them in the streets, they take the palm branches off the side of the road or the branches of the trees there, they throw them in the road. It's to line the streets because King Jesus is coming to Jerusalem, coming to claim his throne, coming to the city. They're singing in the streets. You know the scripture, it's a repeating of an ancient song. The song that blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. May his praises be forever in heaven. Glory in the highest. A great day, triumphant day. In fact, as you leave today, we're gonna have palm branches out there. It's a symbol of an ancient symbol that reminds us to celebrate the fact that your Lord and your King has come to your world. That's what those symbols mean. But that day could have turned out much differently if Jesus were a different kind of leader. If he were chasing fame or power, if he were chasing victory the way the world described victory, it would have been a different day. You remember earlier in his life the enemy tempted him with that particular chasing. He could have taken the throne, he could have unseated Herod, he could have overthrown Caesar, he could have become the king on earth and defeated all his enemies and forced them to bow in front of him. He could have done all that if he defined victory the way the world defines victory, if he were chasing that. But he was a different kind of leader. He was about obeying the will of the Father. What was important to him, what mattered to him, was what the will of the Father was. 
That made life meaningful. That made his mission. That made him meaningful. James talks about this same mystery. Look again at the text, the next verse, in verse 15. James says, instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. See, James is telling us, if you go about your business, planning, profit, whatever you're doing, if you do that without seeking the Lord's will, you're just chasing, it's not going to work. The only way where any of this matters is if you're chasing the will of God. If you're focused on what he's doing. If in the midst of all your planning and your purposes, which are not evil in and of themselves, you're trying to put his will first. Not too long ago, I went to a conference we sponsored here at Bethany Church called Work is Worship. It was a, a tremendous time of listening to business leaders out there in our community that are trying to put James's advice into practice trying to figure out how to bring their plans and their profit-making into align, alignment with God's will. And one of the speakers we heard from that day was a gentleman by the name of Chris Patton. Chris Patton is a third-generation leader and CEO of a large auto dealership in Texas. In, in fact, he was in charge of multiple dealerships. And when it became his time to take over that dealership, he began to think about this fact that God, and feel can challenge that God wanted him to change certain practices in his business, to align them with God's will and God's way, to be honest with people, to treat people well, to treat his employees well, to turn it into a, a God-honoring business. And he tells the story that when he made these changes, there were a lot of questions. And in fact, he went from being the, one of the top auto dealerships in his line to being one of the worst in all this culture shift. It cost him a lot. But in his mind, he was doing what mattered. Now, of course, we want to know, God, I, I hope God turned it around for him, you know. He made all these sacrifices, and I did go online and try to see that. It looks like they're doing fine. They're hiring, by the way. If you want to go to Texas, go down there. But you know what's interesting to me is... In Chris's talk, he never even talked about that part because that didn't matter to him. What mattered is what God was doing. And I thought about that, and, and that, that is such a remarkable instance of humility. He's saying, it, I don't matter. My business don't, doesn't matter. My wealth doesn't matter. What God wants matters. And I want to make sure that what I'm doing aligns with what he's doing. James says that the opposite of all of this is boasting, and he calls boasting evil. You know why it's evil? Because when we're boasting, we're saying, I make myself matter. I, I matter. And we're declaring to the world, I matter because I did this, and I accomplished that, and I made this. And more than a few times, we exaggerate a bit just because we want the world to know that we're important, that we matter. We want everyone to think that we're important, but James called this evil because it's the exact opposite of what we should be doing. It's the reason we don't matter if we're doing that. Because people who matter care about God and God's will. In fact, it's the exact opposite. We don't matter if we're out there doing this on our own. You know when we matter? when God is working through us, when we're seeking to do his will and God is working through us. And most of us, when we get ourselves in that frame of mind, we're like, well, then, but I'm such a poor example. I'm such a poor representative. But here's the truth I want you to grasp, and I think, I believe grace, great, uh, James wants us to grasp this too, that only God's grace can make us matter. If we're out there trying to make ourselves matter, to declare ourselves important, yeah, we don't matter. What matters is God doing his will. 
And so when we submit to God's grace working in us as imperfect as we are, as falling short as we are, and we offer ourselves to God and his grace starts to work in us, then we matter. And here's the thing. We matter even if the world thinks we don't matter. (laughs) See, that's the wonderful part of God's grace. He decides when we matter. The world decides what's important, what's not important. Does God really care about any of that? See, we matter even when it seems like we're not doing anything. When we're sitting there with our child who just won't listen and he's going through an addiction and and we're just talking to him and, and, and we're not seeming to get through, but we're there with him. Do you realize we matter because you're there doing the Lord's will? When you're there sharing with a friend who's lost somebody and you feel like totally useless, you matter because God's grace is working through his will. You're doing his will. It, it, it just changes everything. You matter when there's, you're having that one conversation. Some of you are ministry leaders and you go to your class and there's three people and you're like, oh man, this does not cut it. Yes, it cuts it because that's God's will. So even when you think you're failing and you're not doing it well and you're not, do you understand when we're doing God's will, God's will makes us matter even if the world thinks we're a failure. Because here's the thing, the world's measuring accomplishments. The world is measuring successes. The world is counting wins. God is counting faithfulness. And so in those moments where I feel like giving up and giving in because it just doesn't matter, (laughs) I have to decide to matter. Not because of who I am, but because I know as I seek to do God's will, even in that impossible situation, it does matter, only God knows how. I don't know how. I can't measure the results. But that's not my job. Outcomes are God's problem. My problem is faithfulness. Am I seeking to do God's will? But how does that work in real life? How, how do we translate that decision to matter in the business of life, in the chasing of things, in the doing of time, in the filling of our days? Let's look one more time at the text. James gives us a clue here. Verse 17, he says, If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. So this is our brother, practical James again, our no-nonsense James. He says, look, here's the answer. Do good. Do good. And if you know to do good, if you don't do it, that's bad. So on one level, this is all very simple. You could have had a very simple sermon this morning. I could have said, what does God want us to do with time? And the answer would be, do good. And then we could have all left. And you would have been happier, and you're, some of you are thinking, that would have been a good idea, Dirk. Why didn't we go there? <laughs> well, it's because we pastors get paid by the word, and I had to <laughs> lengthen it out a little bit. <laughs> but actually, I think there's some depth there, and there's some profound wisdom there that maybe we can unpack a little bit. One has to do with that word sin. In the Bible, it has this connotation of falling short. Sin is falling short. See, God is trying to do something in this world. He's trying to do his good will. We pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, that's God's mission. He wants good to happen, but when we don't do good, we fall short. Why? Because God wants good to be spread, which has an interesting effect upon how we view our days. We need to be doing good all the time. We have to be doing good with every spin of the earth, with every tick of the clock. God's goal for us is to do good all the time. See, think about it logically. If God works through our good decisions and our faithfulness, the more we do good, the more we're doing what God wants to do in this world. And so now doing good is not just 
drop a few bucks in the plate or do an occasional charitable thing. It means every single day of our life, we work to do good. Every decision is important, whether anybody knows about it or not. Even our private decisions to do with our time, they matter because God works through the good thing to do the right thing. It's a daily, day in and day out thing. Which again reminds us that all those good things we do, they're important. All those good actions God is working through, even if the world out there doesn't think they're good. Which, here's another interesting point that I think comes from James's statement here. And that is that we change the definition of good here. We said that what happens when profit is defined wrongly? Well, what happens when good is defined rightly? What happens if God decides what's good, not the world? What if God decides that you're good even if the world says you're not so good? What if the world says you're not good because you failed at your business and God says, but that isn't how I measure good. Were you faithful in your business? Were you faithful with the time? What if you got fired at your job for doing something right? The world says you failed, but God said, no, I call that good because you were faithful. The world looked at the cross of Jesus and said, that was a failure, that was bad, that was wrong. And yet that cross became good for the whole world. Why? Because it was faithful. It was what God wanted. It's doing the will of God. Even if the world says it's bad, God will say it's good if we're faithful. So here's the bottom line. As long as it's good, we win. Even if the world says we lose, we won. Even if the world said we were a failure as a parent, if we were faithful the whole time, God said we won. Even if we tried our best at business and it didn't work out, God says we won. Even if we tried our best at our marriage and somehow it fell apart and the world said you failed, God says, no, you're good. So here's the awesome part about doing the will of God. When you do the will of God, everyone gets a trophy. Everyone does good. Even if the world says you failed, you get a trophy because that's God's definition of good when you do the will of God. So what does that mean practically in our day-to-day -day trenches? I want to share with you a little a mantra I repeat to myself many times a day. It's my way of kind of working this through, and I'll share it with you. I have a decision, a phrase I repeat myself over and over again through the day. It goes like this. Focus on good conversations and good decisions. Start there. If we want to do good, if our goal is doing good, and we want to do it all day because God works through good things, good, our decisions, how do we wrestle our mind and wrestle ourselves into the place where we're seeking to do good all the time so that God can work through us and our day-to-day -day can matter? Focus on good conversations, a place and a good decision. So listen, here's the deal. Every time I have a conversation, if I'm in the right state of my mind, I try to remind myself this is an opportunity to do good. Now, I, do, I fail at this more than I wish I did. A lot of times stuff comes out of my mouth. I'm like, well, that's not good. I think I need to up that game. But you see, that's the whole reason why this discipleship thing and why this... this Leaving us on the cross thing. This is why it's important because we have to get better at those good conversations because God works through words of encouragement and affirmation and even challenge sometimes as long as it's done speaking the truth in love. So we got to work. Our words matter. Our conversations matter. Our tweets matter. Our Facebook posts matter. Our emails matter. God wants to work doing the right thing. So focus on good conversations. And I don't know how many dozens or hundreds of conversations you have a day, but they matter to God. Because if you do the right thing, God will work through the right conversations, even if you don't. See how it happens. And the other part, as I say, make good decisions. Just know why you're doing what you're doing. Starts with taking time to stop and think. I'm preaching the choir, you're here today, you're stopping to think. Those decisions are important to take that time to stop and think, because if you don't, you get caught up in the cycle of spinning and you forget why you're doing what you're doing. One of the decisions is I'm gonna stop and think, because I wanna make sure I'm not spinning out of control here. This means something. 
But then we make these decisions, we try to do the right thing. And here's the thing about decisions. Sometimes they work out and sometimes they don't. I know that's shocking to you. Even if they're good decisions, like you, you, you tried to get all the information you could, you tried to consider all the factors, you, you even ran it through artificial intelligence computer, and, and they tell you what the right decision is, and then you make it, and it turns out wrong. But here's the thing, in God's economy, he's in charge of outcomes, we're in charge of faithfulness. So we, we just have to make good decisions, that's all I can own. I can't own the results, I own the decision. Is it a decision that affirms God? Is it a decision that, that, that values other people? So when I catch myself through the day, am I making good decisions about what I'm doing? And listen, we don't, none of us bat a thousand percent. We make bad decisions, but we have to be concerned that our decisions are good decisions and they're seeking to do the will of God. So let's go back to our original question then. How does God want us to spend our time as we kind of wrestle with too much time or too little time? It's not the full answer, but we've learned a couple things. One, we need to stop and focus, stop and think. We need to be honest about what are we chasing. Because if we're in that place where we think we don't matter or my time doesn't matter, or if we're in the other place where we're boasting and we think that's what matters, then it's time, that's precisely the time to say, I'm chasing something. Something that I need to turn over to God because he owns that. And I need to focus on being faithful today. And so we have to decide to matter. We have to decide to matter, not because we're going to do anything in and of ourselves, but we're going to decide that we're going to matter by doing God's will, his way. Today, we're going to give it to God, and we're going to do everything we can today to do God's will. And we know that somehow, through his grace, he's going to make that matter. And I'm going to try to turn this into a lifestyle. I'm going to try to do God, do good daily so God can work through me daily. I'm going to focus on these good conversations and good decisions because in the end, I want to invest my time. See, there is a reason why God put us on this spinning planet in this spinning solar system. Our time around, our trips around the sun, they are important to God. We are important to God. Every single one of us, your trip around this sun is valuable and important. But the meaning and the purpose is going to come when we submit ourselves to his will and his ways. And he will then turn each spin, each click of the clock into a meaningful, important part of his plan. That's how we spend our time, serving our Lord and King. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this truth. We thank you that we are not a waste of time, that this day is not wasted, even if the world counts it as a waste. As we do your will in your way, as we seek as best as possible to understand how you want us to live, you invest in those moments through your spirit to redeem that time for you, to build your kingdom. Accept us as your sacrifice. Accept us as gift to you, and now to use us to extend your kingdom. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen.